on January 31, 2004. Fire crews will be called to a burning home in Osceola, Iowa. Once arriving on the scene, firefighters would fight the roaring blaze, eventually extinguishing it. Unfortunately, the home's young occupant would be found deceased inside after succumbing to his burns. The fire would be labeled an accident, but factors would soon arise that would prove there may have been another explanation. This is Midwest Mystery Files, Episode 11. The Suspicious Death of Cecil Gaddy. Hello everyone, and welcome back after a month and a half. Life's been a bit crazy on this end. My wife and I have bought a house, so we've been preparing that house, plus prepping this house for our buyer, plus normal life things. Stuff has just been a little busy. I wanted to get at least an episode out in the month of October, but unfortunately I just couldn't make it work. Although this episode may be out on Tuesday rather than Monday, we're now back on our normal schedule. The first one back here is another short one, because I still haven't had a ton of free time, but several things stand out in this particular case, and I think it's well worth talking about, as are all our cases, regardless of length. So, if you're one of our normal listeners, welcome back. If this is your first time listening, well, welcome to Midwest Mystery Files. I'm your host, Jeremiah, with just a few quick things before we start. Midwest Mystery Files is a bi-weekly, true crime podcast focused on unsolved missing and murdered cases within the Midwestern region of the United States. I can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast platforms. Now, without further delay, on to today's episode. Cecil Travis Gaddy was born April 8, 1984 to Bobby Gaddy and Denise Roberts. Cecil grew up in the town of Murray, located in Clark County, Iowa. Not much is written about Cecil's early life, but reports have stated that as a teenager, Cecil was quite the active, helpful, and intelligent young man. Cecil worked as a farmhand and would spend his time repairing small engines. He had an ear for music, teaching himself how to play guitar and writing his own songs. He also had an interest in computers and enjoyed helping people with any problems that he had the ability to help solve. From everything that can be told, Cecil was clearly a smart and caring young man. The true measure of his character, though, would come when Cecil would perform a selfless act, at the sacrifice of his own body. At age 16, Cecil was riding in a van with his pregnant sister, her husband, and another individual. At some point, the van would lose control and it began to roll. When the rolling began, Cecil made a split-second decision and threw his body in front of his sister to protect her. This, however, would cause Cecil to be thrown through the windshield, leaving Cecil with a broken back. The crash and resulting broken back would unfortunately leave Cecil paralyzed from the waist down, confining him to a wheelchair. Gaining his independence back would be a struggle at first, as it was difficult for Cecil to keep up with many of the activities he enjoyed. However, he would soon adjust and was able to dive back into activities that mainly required his hands. He was also able to take his trusty wheelchair with him almost anywhere he wanted to go. Not to be held back or slowed down by anything, Cecil would go on to finish high school, and after graduating, he was able to support himself and would begin renting a house located at 315 East Shaw Street, in Osceola, approximately 11 miles to the east of Murray, where Cecil had grown up. Just a quick note, real quick, if you can hear any noise in the background, I apologize. There is clearly some sort of work that started outside of my house, Um, and this is kind of the last chance I have to record in a while, so hopefully it's not too distracting or I can get rid of it in a little bit, or in uh, half when I'm editing the episode. But uh, regardless, I just wanted to point that out to everyone. So anyway, without further delay, get back to the episode. According to reports, Cecil took care of his home and kept it spotless. Unfortunately, though, soon the dirt would start letting itself in. Eventually, Cecil would start hanging out with what has been described as a bad crowd. Reports have described the situation as being that Cecil was giving the individual's money and his pain meds in exchange for their friendship. 
It's never been made publicly known how Cecil came into contact with these individuals, but it's clear that friendship was not their primary goal. In a 2011 interview with WHO TV 13, Cecil's sister, Alicia, would describe them as leeches and would go on to say, They would be at his house, grabbing at him, for all the money he had, the pills that he had, medication. He just wouldn't have anything left for himself. It was sad. It was horrible. The friends, and I'm using that term loosely, parasitic behavior would only continue to escalate. In January of 2004, Cecil would call Alicia and inform her that his friends wanted to set up and run a meth lab out of his house. Deciding to take a stand, Cecil told them no. He also stopped providing money and his pain pills, effectively cutting all ties with them. He, however, did express concern to Alicia as to what they may do next. It would be less than a week later, on Saturday, January 31st, 2004, that tragedy would strike. Fire teams were called to 315 East Shaw Street, Cecil's home, after receiving reports that the house was ablaze. Fire teams would be able to extinguish the blaze, but they would unfortunately be too late. Cecil was found in his bedroom, lying on his bed, face down, deceased. Investigators would begin an investigation into the fire and would very quickly rule it an accident. However, to the family, this was clearly more than any freak accident, for a myriad of reasons. The investigation from the state fire marshal's office concluded that the fire had started on a sofa in the house's living room. I'm going to say that again. On a sofa in the living room. Now, it has been noted that Cecil was indeed a smoker, although there's no indication that a cigarette started the fire. In fact, no actual cause was ever concluded. Furthermore, Cecil was found in a back bedroom, away from the fire. Take these two things, and the idea that Cecil may not have noticed a stray ember before retiring to his room doesn't seem overly far-fetched. He may even have gotten into bed and fell asleep long before he had a chance to smell the smoke. Unlikely, but it's possible. There's just one problem with that scenario, though. It probably would have taken him a minute since he would have had to have drug himself to his bedroom. Why, you may ask? Well, I'll let a note from the state fire marshal's report answer that question. The report stated, Quote, Mr. Gaddy's wheelchair was observed outside the home's front door. The ground surrounding the home was covered with deep snow, averaging 8 inches. End quote. More specifically, it was located outside a few feet from the bottom of his access ramp in the snow. Nobody was ever noted as dropping Cecil off at home that day, and none of his friends or family noted seeing him the night before. This implies that Cecil would have been outside for one reason or another, decided to get out of his chair, somehow get the front door open, and then do whatever he would do inside, and then go to bed, all without the help of his wheelchair. Something his family stated would have been impossible for him to do. Alicia Gaddy would speak to the quickness of the investigation in her 2011 interview, stating, The Clark County Police named it an accident pretty much the same day, and there was no investigation, and they could not find the cause of the fire. Suspicions would further upon review of Cecil's death certificate. The document listed Cecil's immediate cause of death as total body burns, with no mention of smoke inhalation. From what I can best tell through reading on Google is that generally, while it may not kill you right away, smoke inhalation tends to incapacitate an individual prior to a fire, possibly leading smoke inhalation to being listed as at least an intermediate cause of death. To clarify, the immediate cause of death is the final factor or main cause of death, while an intermediate cause of death would be the factor that preceded the immediate cause of death. In this case, something like smoke incapacitating Cecil before the fire could reach him. The key reason there is most likely no mention of smoke inhalation in this case is the fact that the death certificate also notes the autopsy results were not available at the time of the signing of the cause of death certificate. 
In most suspicious cases of fire death, one would say that an autopsy showing no smoke inhalation would be suspicious because that would indicate death before a fire. But in this case, since an autopsy report wasn't available, we just unfortunately really don't know. Reporting and investigation pretty much ends here. Cecil's death was officially labeled an accident, and he was laid to rest February 5th, 2004. The home he was renting was labeled a complete loss and demolished. It now sits as an empty lot. There isn't much mentioned about this case until 2011, when WHO TV 13 out of Des Moines covered it as part of their Gone Cold series highlighting cold cases in the state of Iowa. Even though Cecil's case is listed as an an accident and not a murder, WHO felt there was still enough to go on to include it as a potential criminal case. During the broadcast, WHO reporter Aaron Brobeck would speak with Osceola Police Chief Marty Duffus. Duffus did not work for the police department in 2004 when the fire occurred. However, Brobeck would ask him why would Cecil's wheelchair be outside? At that, Duffus replied with, I would have the same question. How'd the chair get there? But then again, I don't know who to ask. Duffus would go on to explain that with how long ago the fire was, and with no physical evidence remaining, finding any evidence to reopen the case would be almost impossible. Duffus would go on to tell Brillbeck, I hope I don't sound glib, cold, whatever, but the fact of the matter is, if those were concerns, they should have been brought up while the best possibility of some sort of evidence may have existed. The family would indeed insist, however, that they had expressed their concerns of murder and arson even before the fire was extinguished to both police and fire crews, and they would speak continuously with the state fire marshal's office all through the investigation. When speaking to the state fire marshal's office, a department spokesperson would tell WHO TV they spent three months investigating the fire and the lead investigator had lost a lot of sleep trying to figure out why the wheelchair was in the front yard and not in the house, but had never come up with any answers, including the cause of the fire. The spokesperson would go on to say that the state fire marshal's office would be willing to reopen the case if anyone should contact them with new information. In the ten years since that broadcast, not much has changed. Cecil Gaddy's death is still ruled an accident, and most likely due to that ruling, he has received a little attention in the media, aside from the occasional Gone Cold segment, but those are few and far between. Still, I couldn't help but be drawn to his case when I first read about it, as it seemed like there was more than enough factors to indicate it could have been more than any mere freak happenstance. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on theories here, as there's only two that really stand out. The first being that this was merely an accident. Some unknown catalyst started a fire in Cecil's living room, and he proceeded to lay face down in his bed rather than make any attempt to escape to safety. All this after he left his wheelchair outside in eight inches of snow. Eight inches of snow he would have had to crawl through to get into his house. The wheelchair is the biggest red flag to me in this particular scenario. I can fully admit I have use of my legs. I have no idea what it's like to be paralyzed from the waist down. One thing I do know for sure is, if I was in that situation, dragging myself through the snow, up a ramp, and trying to get my door open is the last thing I would want to do, especially with the relentlessly cold Januaries that we're known to have here in Iowa. Sure, maybe Cecil went outside, somehow fell out of his chair, and due to the snow had issues getting back in. From what I can tell on Google Maps, the section of Shaw Street that Cecil lived on dead ends, with only a handful of houses. It's possible if he yelled for help, there could have been no one around to hear him, leaving him with only the option of fighting his way back inside. But I find it unlikely, if for no other reason that one would think that he would have called someone for assistance once he was inside the house, not just pull himself into his bedroom and go to bed. I'm going to apologize again if you guys can hear that jackhammer outside. I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, when I looked outside before um, coming to record, there wasn't any work going on. But hopefully uh, we can keep it to a minimum from being distracting. But uh, anyway, back to the case. The possibility that someone dropped Cecil off from going somewhere 
and that individual carried Cecil inside has also been thrown around. But once again, why would Cecil have his wheelchair left outside and not have the other party bring it in when it was the only means of moving around his house? It just doesn't make sense. Plus, no one admitted to seeing Cecil prior to the fire. If this speculative individual didn't have anything to hide, you would think they would have came forward to and explained the situation. Unless, of course, they thought they could be blamed for Cecil's accidental death and chose to remain quiet. The other theory is that this was a malicious act of arson, and every avenue was covered to ensure Cecil couldn't escape the home before he would succumb to the fire. Let's just take a look at every suspicious circumstance in this situation. The first being the location of Cecil's wheelchair. We've already covered why there was really no reason why it should have been outside. Next, the fire was found to be started on the couch in the living room, while Cecil was found in his back bedroom. This one is a bit harder to analyze, as Cecil was known to be a smoker, and it is possible a stray ember he didn't catch could have landed on the couch and started a slow burn that Cecil didn't catch at first. However, we don't know the actual cause of the fire. At first I thought that was strange. However, looking back at fire fatalities from the last 15 years on the state fire marshal's website, unknown or undetermined, isn't exactly an uncommon listing under the cause of fire section. I did attempt to do some reading on how fires are investigated. However, fire science is a fairly complex and fascinating thing, and I just have a lot to learn before I feel I can personally explain it without oversimplifying it or just explaining it badly or wrong. Basically, I'm in no position to criticize the fire marshal's findings. I only bring up that Cecil was a smoker because as a former smoker, I know embers can sometimes go astray. But I also know you tend to notice when they're burning your couch, even when they're small, especially if you had to take the time to pull yourself to your bedroom. Let's talk about Cecil's location next. He was found in his bedroom, face down, seemingly like he was never aware that a fire was happening at all. We don't know if he had a smoke alarm or not, but considering most people do, I'm going to assume he did, which I imagine would have woke him while he slept. Then, you're going to tell me that Cecil, a proven fighter, based on his handicap alone, the man that sacrificed his body to protect his pregnant sister, was just going to listen to a smoke alarm go off and lay there while a fire tore through the house instead of attempting some kind of escape? I'm not buying it. Granted, for some reason, his wheelchair was outside, but I still find it hard to believe he wouldn't at least attempt to break a window and get out that way. Looking at factors outside the home, Cecil had just cut off ties with some very dubious people. People who were used to taking advantage of Cecil and even wanted Cecil to allow them to start a meth lab in his house. After cutting ties with these people, Cecil tells his sister that he's concerned about what they may do next, and less than a week later, Cecil is killed in a fire. A fire he may have escaped, if his wheelchair he required for mobility wasn't outside in the snow. I don't want to spend a great deal of time on the friends, just because we really know nothing about them other than what's been reported. They've never even been named publicly, but given the circumstances, they're more than worth mentioning. That being said, there could always be others. So maybe it was his former friends who were angry. Maybe it was someone looking for the friends and knew they hung out there. Maybe it was a robber who got caught, or maybe it was someone else entirely. But while it's wholly speculation on my end, it doesn't seem that far-fetched that someone entered Cecil's home, separated him from his wheelchair, incapacitated him before putting him in his bed, and then proceeded to burn his home down, killing him just to cover their tracks. I say he may have been incapacitated because, as stated before, his death certificate has no mention of smoke inhalation. This is most likely due to the fact that an autopsy report wasn't available, making it impossible to tell if he was dead before the fire, either from smoke inhalation or some other factor, or if maybe he had just been knocked out. I feel like these are facts that really need to be known, because at the end of the day, no one is just going to lie face down while their house burns around them. Cecil hadn't let life's misfortunes bring him down to this point, and he seemingly had a great support system with his family. 
As I've said before, I just don't think he would have let it in there without a fight. While he was very straightforward, I can't blame Chief Duffus for being reluctant to reopen the case without new evidence. He didn't work for the department at the time, and more than likely had a little familiarity with the case before being questioned by WHO TV. However, it's clear to me that the Osceola Police Department of the time in 2004 had little interest of looking any further than it being a freak accident, despite the number of red flags in the air. I keep coming back to the wheelchair, but the fact of the matter is, no paralyzed person is going to leave their only form of mobility outside of their house at the bottom of their wheelchair ramp in eight inches of snow. That alone should have warranted a closer look. Cecil Gaddy was more than a guy in a wheelchair who perished in a fire. He was a heroic young man who selflessly threw himself in front of his pregnant sister to save her and her unborn child, knowing full well there could be great cost to him. He then refused to let that bring him down and continued to live his life as best he could. He was a son, a brother, and an uncle. He was a man who gained a second chance in life, a life that was taken from him in a horrific moment. A moment that is more than deserving of another look from investigators. If you have information on the death of Cecil Gaddy, please contact Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation Special Agent in Charge Mike Motzinger at 515-725-6010 or the Iowa State Marshals Division at 515-725-6145. If you're looking for more information, there isn't a ton. There's a handful of retrospective articles. You can also visit Cecil Gaddy's page at iowacoldcases.org. If you want to tell me what you think happened, or have comments, questions, or case suggestions, I can be found on Instagram at Midwest Mystery Files, on Facebook by searching Midwest Mystery Files. You can breathe some life into my Twitter at Files Midwest, or you can email me at MidwestMysteryFilesPod at gmail.com. I also want to thank everyone who has been sharing the podcast. Despite not putting a new episode out for a month and a half, I saw a massive listener growth throughout the month of October. So please continue sharing or telling your friends. It's one of the best ways we can get these lesser known cases out there. Lastly, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts and like what you hear, please feel free to comment and rate. This helps make the podcast more visible in searches and also helps us get these cases out there. Thank you to everyone who has done so already. Take care, everyone, and I will see you all in two weeks.